and uh, that you're all here with us, alhamdulillah, to start this uh, seminar series uh, as we ramp up into Ramadan, inshallah, and then continue from there. We're doing this uh, in relationship with BIS, and we're really happy to have with us the Dean of Administration, uh, Dr. Muhammad Abu Talib, who has come all the way from North Carolina with us uh, to, to, inshallah, educate us and continue us uh, on this journey. Uh, and he's here with his young son, Amin, I think who's the star. I mean, thank you for bringing your dad. We appreciate that. <laughs> so um, just so that you know, inshallah, uh, Dr. Muhammad Abu Talib uh, is also a son of Boston. He did his PhD at MIT, mashallah. Uh, but he's got multiple ijazat as well. And uh, we've had him as our guest before. And those of you who are privileged to be here for Jummah may have heard how excellent khutbah he gave. Uh, and he's a beautiful reciter, as you know. So we're really, really pleased to have him and people like him from BIS. So my point to you is spread the word. Let other people know. We're trying to kind of build some momentum and some thing as we get into Ramadan, inshallah. And this program in person will be going every second Friday of the month. So the next one will be next month, inshallah, 2-9. And then the, the one after that will actually be a Ramadan prep program. So rather than having it on a Friday, which sometimes it could run, we're going to do it on Sunday, right with the Sunday school. So just keep an eye on your email. But essentially, there's going to be one every month, one in-person program, and then some virtual programs. So also interact with us. They're going to be the same speakers from BIS on the virtual platform. You know, what we don't want to have is have all of you here, and then on Wednesday, only two people sign in or something. I know that people interact with the virtual afterwards, but it's nice to have a community there as well. We're trying to make it easy for you. For those of you who can't come so frequently, so the next one is next Wednesday, okay? Inshallah, next Wednesday uh, at about you know, 7, 7.30 p.m. will be the, the virtual program uh, online. You'll get a Zoom link. Just click on that, and inshallah, we can, we can all, all get going. But for today, we built in some extra time. Uh, we said we'd finish around 9. Maybe we'll run a little bit more, depending on whatever uh, our sheikh uh, feels, uh, and leave a little time for questions, inshallah. Uh, but once again, Jazakallah khair for coming. You know, he's a real friend of our masjid. He's really helped us, and we're really kind of happy to have this relationship with BIS. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Hamdi Ibadi Shakirin and Dakirin, was Salatu was Salam, Ala Ashraf and Mursaleen, Nabi and Muhammad, Wala Ali, who was Havi Ajmain, Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, Waisili, Amri, Wahlul Okdatam, Lisani of Kalkoli. To beginning in the name of Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala, I want to thank you all, Alhamdulillah, for the blessing of your uh, company on this blessed night in this blessed masjid. Uh, thank you to Dr. Faisal and to all the esteemed leadership and the people of this community that have helped bring this together. On a personal note, uh, whenever I come to this space, I very much feel at home, alhamdulillah. And uh, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the warmth of this community, um, the eagerness of those that have invested in the space, alhamdulillah, the leadership that you have in terms of your relationships with the broader community, in terms of always uh, pushing yourselves to live Islam in the most beautiful manner is something that stands out even as a traveler and now, alhamdulillah, more and more being able to share your company in this community. And on behalf of the Boston Islamic Seminary, I'm also very pleased, alhamdulillah, that uh, Allah blessed this relationship to grow. Alhamdulillah, we have two of our esteemed graduate students here, Brother Musa, Sister Fatima, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. And... Uh, over the next several months across a, a diverse array of critical topics, have an opportunity to engage with a, a diverse array of scholars, of community leaders, of thinkers. Um, and I'm grateful, alhamdulillah, for the investment in Islamic learning. And it is not surprising to me that many of the pillars and the supporters of the Wayland uh, community of the Islamic Center of Boston at Wayland are also pillars and supporters of the Boston Islamic Seminary and so many other things. Really, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses certain people to be pillars. Uh, 
of the work and stewardship that we need as a Muslim community. And so I ask Allah to select us and honor us to be among the people, inshallah, that are sitting, gathering, and seeking uh, knowledge, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala record this gathering as a source of joy for us on the last day. Allahumma ameen. Today, inshallah, our topic of discussion is looking at some dimensions of the matter of social justice in al Islam. And it's a broad topic, but we've selected a couple angles, inshallah, hopefully particularly relevant to the challenges that we are contending with at this moment uh, as our country and our people uh, contend with the ongoing the genocide and horrific unspeakable harm in the, for the people of Gaza and Palestine in particular. Uh, while we are not unmindful of the suffering of other peoples worldwide, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them safety and security and shelter, and to make us agents of change. Uh, and in these troubling times where so many lend either support or silent approval among our fellow human beings. And it is with that intent that in Salatul Jumu'ah, we spoke about a critical chapter of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his participation in Hilful Fudul, the, the covenant of virtue, the agreement of the righteous and virtuous people. Our Prophet I was just with your youth group, Alhamdulillah, you have a very active and engaged youth group. And I emphasize to them that he was their age. Our Prophet I witnessed about four years of conflict that uh, upset the, the, the order of Mecca, but ended in something that really transformed an element of their society. And he was the age of, mashallah, we had a lot of young people at the masjid tonight and in this gathering. He was that age. He was a teenager. He was just too young to participate in, in the fighting directly, but he felt the impact of the conflict on his, and he was the among the youngest participants when they gathered in the house of the oldest man of, of Mecca, Abdullah ibn Judayan, and they agreed to support the oppressed against the oppressor, right? And this was very counter to the ways of the Arabs at that time. They had no court of law. They had no judges, nowhere to take a civil dispute or take a complaint. So if you were from a powerful tribe, you got your way. And if you weren't, then you, there was really very little you could do if you didn't have the protection of someone. That's why Hijra was almost unheard of. This was so difficult for the companions because when you left, it was beyond leaving your home and your position. You were leaving every support system you have in life. So when they took this step as a society and they took it with courage, they actually, in their commitment, they promised to stay upon this course until there was not a drop left into the ocean. And until the act of Istilam, one of the acts around the Kaaba was ended. So they were saying, until the very end of times, we will commit to this. What's remarkable, Mecca did not have a president or did not have a king, but it had chieftains. But that's not who was addressed through Hilf al-Fudul actually. The man who was done wrong, that became the catalyst, addressed the center of Mecca. Right? He addressed the heart of Mecca. He told these people, how is it that this injustice occurs while you're next to the Kaaba, while you claim to be the children of Fihr and Quraysh. And they moved their leaders, among them as, as Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, Abdullah ibn Judayan and others that made this commitment. Our Prophet wasallam, some 40 and more years later, after he's made Hijrah to Al-Madinah al munawwara is back in Mecca, but as a traveler. And he's walking in the streets of Mecca with younger companions, some of whom did not witness this, some of whom were not born when this happened. So Prophet ﷺ was only a teenager, so many companions were not born when this happened. And the Prophet ﷺ, as he passes by the location of the house of that man, says, لَقَدْ شَهِدْتُ فِي دَارِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ جُدْعَانَ حِلْفًا مَا أُحِبُّ أَنَّ لِي بِهِ حُمْرَ النَّعَمْ that I saw, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an a covenant, an agreement, a pact that I would not trade for a herd of prized red camels. This is like saying a huge sum of money 
or like a fleet of luxury vehicles in our values. And if I were invited to its like, in Islam, meaning as a prophet, I would immediately answer. So what he's saying, that that readiness now, after revelation, to engage with people that may not be Muslim, that may not share that same faith, uh, or, but share the values of justice, or want to work towards a common good, that the Prophet ﷺ was eager and ready to engage in that type of work. One of the reasons we selected to highlight, this is just a summary of some key points from the khutbah, was because more than 100 days into a human tragedy, where one day is one day too many, where one child is one child too many, where one family affected is one family too many, there's a lot we have to contend with in our hearts and minds as believers. Sometimes in these situations, it's very overwhelming, and it can be difficult to find the staying power to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's steadfastness and strength through Him to continue to advocate for the cause of good. And this is why I was emphasizing to the, to the group of youth earlier that actually, as a believer, we are more, we seek to be more than activists. When we say social justice activists, there's good in this, right? But in the word, at the core of it, you're motivated by the activity, right? So a person is engaging in whatever activity you think is going to make a positive difference that is within the halal. Maybe it's a rally, maybe it's calling elected officials. Maybe it's educating others. And you know what? If you don't care for a particular activity or you don't think it's, it's effective, but it's halal, no problem. Let others do it and you focus on something that you think is more effective, right? We don't need to get in one another's way. But the challenge with some of the most difficult causes of justice is that change can take time. So those that are motivated by the movement at first, or by the outrage, or by the emotion, they burn out, right? Sometimes Allah Taala wills a quick change. But often, for the largest changes in society, they take time. Hilful Fudul itself, it was sparked by the injustice of one man and the conflict. But before that, there were injustices that happened to others that did not spark the society to change. Allah is mindful of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the person that does not get the right in dunya, Allah does not let it go to waste in dunya or in the akhirah, certainly. But in seeking these changes, a person must stem, must seek strength from a deeper source than just the emotion or the movement of that moment, right? And this is something we are contending with. In fact, I would go further and suggest to you that there are moments in life that call for a strength that is beyond human strength. Really, when you look at the utter sacrifice and steadfastness of some of our brothers and sisters facing such utter injustice. The strength from which they tap through their Iman, this is something beyond our measure as human beings, right? It's something that is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Iman, through faith. And we are not far from this as American Muslims. Our predecessors as American Muslims, really part of the inheritance of this space, are people that contended, Muslims that contended with generational wrongdoing and contended that they may work for causes that they will not witness the change in their lifetime, but that it's worth working for, right? Before, you know, I've been learning, mashallah, about the history of the center, right? And the original, uh, uh, was this space, correct? But, you know, not the entirety, but part of it, and then the expansion, 
Mashallah, hearing some of the stories of, you know, going back and forth in the building permit, you know, the challenges that people sometimes may miss when they see the finished part product. But in some regard also, the struggle to pray in peace and security in this space goes well beyond the previous 40 years that you're about to celebrate as a center. Although that's incredible, there is an element of the legacy of the center that goes to those that could not pray in security in these lands. But imagine today where people would be able to worship. One of the Muslims before us in these lands, for example, Ayuba Sulaiman Jallu, Rahimahullah, he used to go out into the forest in the mid Atlantic five times a day in order to pray. You have to keep in mind for most of our Muslim brothers and sisters, they were living at a time where you could be killed for reading a book. If you're seen doing salah, this was out of, of conception for our brothers and sisters, predominantly from West Africa, that had to struggle this much just to pray their five prayers. SubhanAllah, you went through a, 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 a struggle that was very similar to what the Prophet ﷺ faced in that a, a, a young boy, a young white boy, and you know, children don't know racism until they inherit it from grown-ups, would actually hurl like dirt and filth upon him while he was in sujood, as our Prophet ﷺ faced in Quraysh. So what am I saying? In order for us to find these opportunities today, there were people before that imagined working towards these causes of justice, whether they witnessed that change or not. Now, don't get me wrong. It is my sincere prayer to Allah wa Taala that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala beautify our gaze and so on to see days on this world when Allah has given us so much resources, so much relative peace in many parts of the world that we don't see these ugly injustices perpetrated against the most vulnerable, right? With the silent complacency of world leaders. I hope and I pray to Allah to grant us life to witness this and agency to contribute to it. But we are committed that if we do not, it is worth working towards until it is handed off to the next generation. It is a worthy cause. And in order to have that drive, sometimes you have to work to a cause for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you feel like the person in front of you doesn't deserve it. When it's hard to find the benefit of the doubt. When it's frustrating because some opposition has no boundaries. But you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are moments where our faith comes to life. These are moments where our faith comes to life. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to share with you, and this comes in the middle of Surah Yusuf. It's a part of his life that's sometimes missed in this regard. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, of course, a glorious and powerful story. I want to look particularly at his contribution as a person that worked for justice even when society turned its back on him. And in ayah number 35 of surah number 12, the surah that bears his name, surah Yusuf, Allah wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ بَدَى لَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا رَأَوُ الْآيَاتِ لَيَسْجُنُنَّهُ حَتَّى حين. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, as you know, was born in a house of prophethood, but separated from his father, cast out to a near certain death. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was charting his path from that well. A caravan picked him up and sold him into slavery, though that was illegal by their norms. He was taken by a just man in Egypt. And in that he learned skill and ability from the financial minister, but he was done wrong by some of the elites of the society. Allah says in the meaning of this verse, then it came to them even after they saw the indisputable evidence of his innocence, that they would cast him into jail 
for an unappointed term. So Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam has faced dhulm upon dhulm upon dhulm. I want you to take for a moment and to really, um, one of the things that brings the transformative power of the Qur'an closer to our hearts is not to fast forward to the end of the story that you already know. You have to imagine what it feels like to be in that space in that moment where you don't know how this story is going to turn out. And you imagine a person in the position of Prophet Yusuf salam taken into slavery. That is oppression enough. But then after living a chaste life and dignity and so on, people speak about his honor, about his chastity, as if he was doing the unspeakable with the wife of Al-Aziz, and he didn't do anything wrong, right? And this is until in our Sharia, it's one of the biggest sins, right? To speak about a person's honor and slander. This is the sin that Sayyidina Maryam and Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam and Aisha, some of the greatest Muslims, witnessed this as a test. It's one of the worst things that a person can do. And he witnessed this and he was exonerated. But then after all of that, <coughs> when it was inconvenient, if you allow me to say it, the society decided to cut a loose thread. Like to do the right thing was too inconvenient. He's an outsider. So they made him disappear as if that was a solution to the problem. Can you imagine a lesser person? How much resentment, frustration, Anger that could build in a heart. And why am I saying this? Wallahi, I feel it. Sometimes you are your colleagues are sitting there and you're watching the news. The latest lying face is their twisting reality that is clear as daylight. And some colleagues or friends or neighbors may be prone to believe this. And you know what? At that moment, it can be really hard to cut somebody the benefit of the doubt. Like, don't you know any better? Or sometimes as people, you know, gobble up anti-Muslim prejudice or prejudice against people of color and so on, it can be very difficult to cut a person the benefit of the doubt. One of the reasons that we are lifting this story today, so Paolo, to give you one, one example, The year was 2018. How many years ago was that? Five to six years, right? There was a, 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 a person, a fellow American, not Muslim, who posted on social media a very short statement. He said, where's Palestine? This was in response to some news stories, and he, if somebody understood, this would be a very evil and aggressive thing to say. This man actually posted it out of a level of pure, absolute ignorance, in the sense that for many maps and atlases, if you try to find Palestine modern times, it does not show. I mean, that's not an accident, right? Maybe, if you're lucky, maybe, the Palestinian territories would come up. But many, it doesn't show up, and that's not an accident. It's by design. So this person was asking for a place of pure ghafla, true lack of awareness and knowledge. He just, like, where can you find it on a map? And I want you to know, it, that's, it's hard right now. I mean, people are dying. Families are being ripped apart. People are losing, you know, dozens of family members. It's hard to find the space of heart and mind to cut the benefit of the doubt for that level of ignorance. But you know what? Five years ago, somebody did. He cut that man, this is an actual person, the benefit of the doubt, and took it upon himself to educate this man. You know what that person is doing today? He's not Muslim. He has no family, not in Palestine, not in any Muslim-majority country, and no business interest. 
but his entire advocacy and social media is about the right and the plight of the innocent people of Palestine. He got educated. But it started with what? One person who extended the opportunity for a relationship and that opportunity for education. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, it's quite remarkable that after they turned on him in this most ugly way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala celebrated his da'wah in jail more in the Qur'an and conveyed to us more of its words than his da'wah as a leader of a civilization and in freedom. It's quite remarkable, actually. And this reminds us as we work for change that a person does not know through what action and what pursuit a person may draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, does not know which action is accepted and which action might be impactful by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. After this, a unique situation happened. And if you allow me, I want us to really settle in to imagine at this moment what it was like to be in that situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ And each of these, the stories of the messengers past, we relate to you what will make your heart firm. So these examples, they were inspiration for our Prophet wasallam. how the Prophets before him and the righteous before him faced adversity and overcame it. And they are the same to us as the example of the Prophet wasallam himself is. Now what happens, the Qur'an shares with us that the king, he has a dream. What happens in the dream? Anyone remember? So there's seven very, you know, well-fed fat cows being devoured by seven lean ones. And what else? Seven full ears and grains of corn full of, full of the... Uh, 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 the, the crop and others that are barren. And the king asks his court for an interpretation. What do they say? They say, What a strange dream, and we don't understand, uh, you know, in the interpretation of dreams. Now, remember what I said. Prophet Yusuf السلام, had to deal with a people that turned their backs on him. A people that betrayed him over and over again. A ruling elite, maybe even if the general population of Egypt had not done something to him, but these ruling elites had done wrong by him over and over and over again. And who remembers in ayah number 53? Who remembers? I know somebody that interprets dreams. His jailmate, his jailmate was supposed to tell the king, right? And he, and he didn't, right? So what does the Qur'an relate? He comes back to jail and he says, uh, This man tells the king's court, I will tell you its interpretation, so send me, send me to the jail. Let's see, come to Yusuf, ayyuha siddiq Yusuf, my old friend, right? Aftina, explain to us. Fi baqaratin simani, the seven cows and so on and so forth. Now with full respect to the Qur'an, I want us to just pause for a moment and imagine a lesser person in this situation, right? Why am I doing this? I want us to appreciate how magnificent the character of this Prophet is through his Iman and Allah. You know, my family is from, from, from Egypt, you know what somebody, uh, ancestrally, you know what they say here? Say, Sabah al-Khair, right? Good morning. Yusuf, old friend, where is the friend for the last 10 years? Been languishing in jail, right? A lesser person coming in, no introduction, no apology, asking for help. Why would I want to help you? But that's why I'm emphasizing a social justice activist 
is different from a Muslim or a mu'min that is working towards a cause of justice. This is very important to emphasize. This doesn't mean we don't know how to work with others. doesn't mean that a person needs to be Muslim in order to work towards honorable things. But the Muslim is working for something more than the human being in front of him. As Allah says elsewhere in the Quran, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إنما نطعمكم لوجه الله لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا We are feeding you for sincerely for the sake of Allah. We are not seeking a reward or thanks. Now, it's good to thank people. Like when we're receiving, we should thank people. But the idea here is that a person has elevated to a higher level. One of the signs that a person's deed is close to acceptance is that they're a consistent person. People's undue praise and undue criticism, it doesn't affect what you're doing. Somebody says thank you and somebody doesn't, you do the same thing. People give spotlight and people don't, you still show up. You see, showing up as a believer is a sign, inshallah, of acceptance. Now, Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam here is at a unique position. Remember, nobody else understands the, this dream. Yusuf alayhi salam himself is the only one that knows that this dream indicates that they're headed towards a very serious situation. They need to manage this. Otherwise, this famine could affect not just Egypt, but surrounding uh, 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 civilizations, right? Like the family of Yusuf is not in Egypt when they come during these years of famines. So something is going to affect a huge region. Nobody knows that but him. So all of a sudden, he has enormous leverage over the people that have done nothing but wrong to him over all these years. Could you imagine what a lesser person would have done with this? I want you to appreciate this deeply. Could you imagine what a morally uncentered person would do with this? For example, a person could have, I'll tell you the interpretation, when you compensate me for this mess that you put me through, right? You could demand whatever price anybody would pay. This is life and death, this is future, right? And part of that price to a point is absolutely the right to demand, like the compensation for the dhulm is actually perfectly legitimate to demand. A person could have made that a condition to support and serve and do the right thing. A lesser person could have, now this is really evil, bear with me, this is a lesser person, right? But a person could have demanded any price and then deceived. Nobody knows what the right answer is. You see what I'm saying, right? And why am I giving these examples? Because I'm sad to say we see those types of people all around us, right? Like honestly, right now, families being torn apart and so on, if you can't contribute Forgive me, can, could people just close their mouths? Like these people that have no shame on social media, online. Like it's bad enough that they don't have the backbone to do something useful. Couldn't they do us the favor of just being quiet? The fact that our times witness more refugees than any time in human history and generational wars where again, you know, at this hour, the, 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 the suffering in Gaza and Palestine is at a higher level than, than any other, and so it deserves a special focus. But we're not unmindful that there are a generation of people coming up in the Horn of Africa or in parts of Asia, right, that are in such systemic vulnerability, they ha don't know what the rest of the world looks like. They're trapped. They can't get out if they want to, can't get educated if they want to. Why? Because people are getting a, 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 a price on the backs of the innocent. If a person is a world leader or in a position of influence or a business leader or a principal and they don't have the backbone or the ability to do something useful, at least be silent. 
But what do you see? Cowardice, right? You see people اشتروا به ثمنا قليلا, right? So why do we appreciate that? Because someone lesser in the story of Prophet Yusuf could have done exactly that. They have all the leverage, everything. I'll give you a third example. Some people, when they're burned by others, they become very hard-headed, mm. jaded, angry. Could you imagine that a person, a lesser person in the shoes of Prophet Yusuf, could have refused to interpret it and refused to go anywhere? Why do I say this? A lot of Muslim populations in our times very highly traumatized populations. You see how Prophet Yusuf went through betrayal after betrayal, dhulm after dhulm. Sadly, in our times, there is a lot of dhulm and a lot of Muslim peoples, a lot of Muslim families are exposed to it. If you don't put in the work for the deen, to liberate that heart and mind, a person can internalize it and become trapped by it. So some people, when they see that, they're trapped by it. And so they don't interpret, don't contribute value, don't get out, don't do anything, right? Can you and I appreciate what Prophet Yusuf السلام, did now in the Quran al karim After his former jailmate gives him the dream. What is he asking for? This is a very subtle question. What is he asking for? The jailmate, the former jailmate. He wants the interpretation of the dream, right? He wants to know what the dream means. What did Prophet Yusuf give him? Indirectly, he gave him the interpretation, but notice the ayat. He said, you shall plant the land, cultivate the land for seven years. What you harvest, store it, except for a little that you eat. Then there will come seven difficult years that will consume all that you stored, except for a little that you put aside so that they have something to plan. Then there will be a year of comfort. That's more than the interpretation of the dream. What is it? It's a solution for their situation. You see Prophet Yusuf السلام, gave them more than they asked for without asking anything in return. That is the believer. That is the rahmah of the believer. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that the believer is naive. Somebody says, where's Palestine? And then you talk to them, you realize they're selling, they're not buying, they have no interest, and you can move on from that conversation, right? Somebody's wasting time, somebody is obstinate. You know, you don't transgress against your eyes, you can move on. I'm not saying the believer is naive. But rahma, mercy, in, of the believer encompasses showing mercy to those that have not been merciful to you. Encompasses doing good for the sake of Allah when you don't have hope that the person in front of you will reciprocate. Encompasses investing in goodness with a hope and a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're uncertain if the reward will come from people in front of you. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لَن تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَرَاحَمُوا قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ كُلُّنَا رَحِيمٌ قَالَ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بِرَحْمَةِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَاحِبَةٌ وَلَكِنَّهَا رَحْمَةُ الْعَامَةِ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, You will never believe until you show mercy to one another. Rahma, this comprehensive mercy. The companions said, O Messenger of Allah, all of us are merciful. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said, I am not talking about one of you showing mercy to his friend, but a comprehensive mercy towards everyone. So part of what we are building 
and seeking to build in our communities is this concept that even when our society forgets what right is, we will not forget and we will remind them. When I say we, I don't mean Muslims exclusively. There are many people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysu sawa'a. That the people of the books and, other, and others, they are not all the same. In fact, in this matter specifically, not all Jews are Zionists. Not all Zionists have such callous disregard for the rights of Palestinians. And not all Palestinians are Muslims. One of the truly unexplainable things of our times is how actually so many Christians worldwide watch people in the birthplace of Isa alayhi salam not be able to celebrate their own religious traditions and Christmas and so on. But this is the level of naivete and ignorance, right? That these kind of tropes and hatred settles in the minds of people who don't know any better. So this is very important and I want to really emphasize it to, this, uh, to each of us for our children most imp importantly. That sometimes when, you know, right and wrong become mixed, when wrongdoing becomes widespread, it's important to create spaces and places that reinforce the difference between haq and batil. And particularly here in this community, really you have an opportunity to be in the forefront of this work because you have strong relationships, alhamdulillah, with the interfaith community, with other Muslim communities many of whom are doing truly courageous and strong work, right? And we demonstrate and show the ability of Muslims to work alongside others for the collective and common good. I want to close, inshallah, before leaving some time for questions. You know, within this community and beyond it, are young women and young men that may feel very much alone in their high schools or in their colleges or in their spaces feel like they're being left out. Within this community are people that came from various backgrounds, worked hard, invested, part of building this community, this country. Some people's families here trace back generations in these lands. And all of a sudden, in a moment, they are seen primarily from citizen to suspect for something they have nothing to do with, share nothing for. These are difficult things to contend with. Just as Prophet Yusuf salam, had to contend with the reality of a group of people that had betrayed him over and over and over again, but he stayed focused and imagining the well-being of the general society of the Egyptians that were not complicit, were not part of this wrongdoing. There are some people, by the way, some of these despicable people are Muslims. As Muslims, we are people of principle. Some people, they took a cheap price on the backs of the vulnerable and the weak. They chose the path of cowardice. They know exactly what they're doing and they get a lot of money and votes out of it. And these people, their account is before the Lord of the worlds, who is mindful of everything. And they should be opposed through appropriate and legitimate and legal and wise means. Nobody should be foolish, right? As a community, we complete one another. Some people's jobs, some people's works, the way that they contribute is not by sharing something on social media. Others can. Some people are in education, some people in advocacy. I heard from so many young people today that they're going into the fields of advocacy, of leadership, of law to try to affect change. That can be part of this legacy. But it's important that we connect with what Prophet Yusuf salam connected with. Although it's difficult, there is a mass, particularly among Americans, who remain remarkably ignorant of these realities who remain prone to the incessant hatred and prejudice of what is black, brown people, Muslims, Palestinians, that 
they quickly uh, ingest this hatred without an alternative to turn to. And one of the capabilities we have as American Muslims is not only to speak to how we wish to see our elected officials, the dollars and the, ta the hard earned tax dollars, which by the way, last time I checked, that's your money and mine. They're not spending their own money. That's our money. We contribute as you know, taxpayers and have the right to speak to how we want to see it shape a more just and peaceful world. And as we work towards that, we hope to work towards the day where the center of America is more aware and more vocal in imagining when the might and power of this country is used to make us and others more secure rather than perpetuating conflict and war and the instruments of, of, of subjugation and oppression that sadly many people suffer from as we enjoy relative plenty and comfort compared to so many in the world. Again, I want to thank each of you, alhamdulillah, for the blessing of your uh, company and especially the opportunity to engage this critical, this heavy, but I hope this empowering topic that each of us has the opportunity to shape through our relationships, people that will not step foot into a masjid or meet an imam or sheikh or scholar, man or woman uh, in their lifetime, but will see the principles of this deen through their relationship with you as a neighbor or colleague or professional, or friend, or so on and so forth. Inshallah, with the time that remains, I'm happy, inshallah, if you have any question, please ask. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Last time you quick reminder for our uh, Muslim community that not all people educated about the current event and people look as international community standard as our standard. And the international community has a lot of hypocrisy. And some people are confused what is right and what is wrong. And some people actually label the resistance as... Because we are streaming this, just so that people on the streaming can hear you. As I said, the people, like even Muslim, are not educated about the current uh, situation and they look at the international community standard as our standard and of course our standard is a lot better than the hypocrisy and whatever so some people get confused even label the resistance and people who's fighting for their freedom as they are doing something wrong so what is your like comment or clarification on this matter and what our value should be holding to a higher standard, not to the international community. You know, as you look at um, adults in the American Muslim community, as a community, this is a very highly educated community with a lot of global awareness, right? Generally, it's actually the second most highly educated religious minority in America. I would encourage our respected families to be aware of two things. First, do not assume your children have the level of awareness that you do, especially if they were born or mostly raised in America, right? Generally, Americans have less global awareness and travel less. This is starting to change. You know, in 1990, less than 10% of Americans had a passport. Around five-ish percent of Americans had a passport in 1990, right? And that gives you an idea that there's much less global awareness and the awareness of the plight of people and how people are living and so on and so forth. And so if your children are raised in America, they're part of that culture, right? Until that education is gotten through experience or through travel or through study, there's no reason they would have the awareness that many of their parents and adults among the American Muslim community have. This can be changed through education and experience. Part of that, by the way, is local travel. It's important for people to be aware of how people live in New England, maybe outside some of the more comfortable you know, zip codes. Like if Allah has given you wealth and comfort, uh, alhamdulillah, and your needs are met, we say alhamdulillah, may Allah complete and perfect his favor upon you. 
But as people go, not just overseas, but around here and see how people are contending with poverty and hardship, that grows your understanding. No doubt also, when you see the plight of the oppressed and learn also American history, this grows a person's awareness, right, of how so many people, uh, and in particular as we look at the Palestinian cause, you have a generation that, as it was described, are growing up in the largest open-air prison in the world. I'm not saying that out of disrespect. I'm saying that out of a description that they cannot travel. They cannot go apply to any universities. They cannot leave, cannot go across a border crossing here and there. And so you don't know what the rest of the world, cannot know what the rest of the world looks like. And there are other peoples that suffer to a lesser extent. So that's what I would encourage for us to educate our families, not to take this for granted. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I heard not only are like halakat and, and groups occurring, Alhamdulillah, to educate, but even locally there are some opportunities where uh, young people are, are taking retreats, like, you know, at local campsites or maybe even traveling to opportunities like Umrah or historical trips abroad. This all really shapes a globally aware believer. And I encourage you, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens those doors for you, to take advantage of it. And then to be aware also that so many Americans don't have the awareness that many of us take for granted in this community. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Question. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you spoke about uh, appealing to the center, building relationships, and but also not being naive. And the believer is not naive, but always tries to give more uh, than what has been asked. I live in a predominantly white town nearby, a very Jewish town, and it has what I consider to be pretty performative diversity groups and town organizations that um, want to get the Muslim voice support to show up for events and they want us to MC things and be part of the community, um, which I appreciate because they want to have Muslim representation, but often feels like they're just trying to get token Muslims in front of like a stage um, rather than actually trying to hear Muslim voices, concerns, or create a sense of belonging. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Like our community is um, planning to do a, a community-wide iftar during Ramadan as a way to build more visibility for the Muslim group um, in our town and to invite lots of people from varying faiths and neighborhoods so they can come and we can uh, do some dawah and kind of create a presence. But I'm also concerned um, or just sort of like nervous about the idea of like, I don't want to be an apology, like, I don't want to apologize. I don't want to constantly have to condemn things, this and that, like we shouldn't have to apologize for, for being who we are. So it, in this time that's very fractured, do you have any advice on how to engage and how to think about doing this in a productive way that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to condemn ourselves all the time? A lot of really um, important considerations there. I will highlight that particularly um, Muslims in America are prone to mistake access for power. What do I mean by that? If, for example, an elected official shows up at Eid, or there's like a large celebration at Iftar, these are not necessarily bad things, but that's just showing access. It's not surprising when you think a person is motivated by verse one that they show up when they have a big audience. When you're able to be in conversation and to be seen for the fullness of who you are, to have a voice, as an individual or as a community, that is indicating more of a relationship, right? So I would not look down on these opportunities, right? Whether it's something as simple as iftar or a meal or so on, those, um, lo th those activities can be an opportunity through which relationships are deepened, right? And uh, with that in mind, and something useful that people can study, Muslims can study, is the, the concept of community organizing as, a pair, as opposed to, to, to activism, right? How to really organize and engage in relationships. One of the key teachings of our deen is working towards al-maslah al the, the, the general good, right? And a big part of that for us as Muslims is showing up for causes that are just, not just the causes that affect us. The nature of things is that typically people have more impact 
at the local level, right? The regional level before the state and national level, right? So that's not to say not to participate, but I would love to see, as, as I've heard Hamdur is happening here, Muslims are more present on things in terms of land and zoning and education and jobs, all of which have Muslims have an important voice in. Locally in building those relationships that helps a person affect change at a larger level. At the end, these are general reflections. When you look at any activity, right, the weighing that you're doing is generally a weighing of benefit versus harm, right? As long as an activity is generally halal and you're able to, you know, observe your values, really what you are weighing is the benefit that you anticipate is coming from it versus the harm or waste of time, right? So as a person gives the benefit of the doubt, again, an iftar can be the part, beginning of a relationship. But, you know, a person that is asking to, you know, when I was a, a, a local faith leader, I had to contend with the reality that honestly so many of the churches in our region, they just assumed that Muslims were terrorists and you give them the benefit of the doubt in the beginning. Let's have that conversation. Let's talk about it. But then after this time, if you're finding that that is not bringing fruit or so on, there's no harm in shifting to another activity or another community. That is ultimately a weighing of benefit of versus harm. But in general, there is more benefit and more values. A person is able to move from just the transactions or the moments to a more relationship-based. And I think, quite honestly, a very heavy realization that many Americans are coming to, uh, many American Muslims are coming to in this season, right, is that this uncritical embrace of the political left or the political right is not working out like some Muslims expected, right? This is neither my expertise nor the space to talk about whatever that's your choice. However, people that thought that it's just a red carpet and so on and that this candidate or that candidate or left or right has their interest, you're seeing it's not a matter of disagreement the community is really dealt with it as if it doesn't exist, as if the voice is not there. And that's a, a rude wake-up call, right? That we really need to think about being in relationship with people that are taking these principles and values a little bit more seriously, right? And showing that we should have a seat of the table and we want to clear a seat for that table for others. Also, there's a lot of people that we want to work with for the betterment of this country and this society. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. He has the microphone here. Um, so I want to preface my question a little bit um, with some background of how I see things. Um, I feel like in the Muslim community, specifically this community that is predominantly South Asian and Arab, um, there's a lot of privilege in this community, I think. And I guess sort of my question is, how do we use this moment that we are in right now to make it more into a movement? To make it more into a movement? And what I mean by that is, you had mentioned this in your khutbah that a very common question is why do Muslims only show up when it's a Muslim cause? Um, and the way I see it in 2014 and 2020, Muslims didn't turn up, but now we're seeing, you know, other groups specifically, um, our black brothers and sisters and Latinx brothers and sisters, Muslim and non-Muslim showing up for this cause. So how do we use this moment to reckon with what we as a community, specifically speaking to South Asian and Arab Muslims, what our attitudes have been and moving forward, what our attitudes should be and how we can use this moment to create a larger movement of breaking down white supremacist structures, which take advantage of differences within our community and between our communities. Zakunal khairan may Allah reward you, bro. A lot of very important points. Um, and I think as we look up at 
at the ethnic diversity that makes up our communities. Uh, I think you've alluded to an understanding of our place in American history in particular, and lost opportunities and lack of attention um, in, in past years for many people towards not only causes of justice for which every Muslim should seek to be at the forefront, but particularly communities um, and, and an inextricable part of the history of this country that are a big part of the economic comfort and the privilege generally that post-1965 immigrant communities from, you know, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia enjoyed. Th those two are not se separable, right? And, and owning that, in fact, I think while asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless uh, and, and, and preserve the blessings that he's shown each of our families, owning that and feeling a responsibility to really invest so that others can have a part of that pie, right? And that, that uh, both in America and worldwide is a critical opportunity at this moment. And that's why, you know, today I've been intentional to mention Palestine, to acknowledge that uh, at this hour, with the intensity of suffering there, it is appropriate that the focus is there. It is appropriate that the focus of the Ummah has, has fallen there as, a, as a, a victims of settler colonialism and such a, a, a wholesale erasure. But absolutely, we should not fall into only caring when Muslims are at the end of that the, the reach of oppression or Arabs or Middle East or whatever, right? So hopefully part of that catalyzing that movement that you're talking about is a recognition that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really has caused something so heavy, right? To shift the focus of the ummah that in some sense there's a heaviness in our hearts why we didn't shift earlier, why we weren't more aware earlier and a desire to really not let go of that opportunity and that momentum, not to be lulled to sleep by the material comfort and the privilege that comes from this country, but in fact, to imagine using the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, the education, the opportunities that many people enjoy here more than many parts of the world, to extend that to others, to make an impact, right? Even if, you know, in whatever way you're able to do in whatever cause, you're able to do. Malcolm X, rahimahullah, al Hajj Malik al Shabazz, there's a book that describes uh, this element of his writing and his letters called On the Side of My People. And he laments, he regrets having to choose between the pull between these two items that the people of faith, right, believers, should be at the forefront of advocating for justice for marginalized peoples. But as he was coming up as a great faith leader himself, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also, you know, laments a similar thing in the Christian community. He was struggling how in the 1960s, as black Americans were suffering such horrors, right, and had such a critical moment, that too many masajid were not dialed into that frequency, right? We're not bringing the light of their faith towards that work. And he was saying he shouldn't have to make that choice. But if he did, he chose to be on the side of my people, right? That he would be close to the people that are working towards social justice. I think what we have an opportunity here is to have a very prophetic approach that our iman, our Islam, our ibadah, our worship moves and motivates us to be voices especially for the most vulnerable and advocates with the privilege and, and opportunities and education Allah has given us to work towards justice for all people inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best Sheikh thank you very much I wanted to ask a very quick question regarding the part where you mentioned the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam and him providing a solution instead of being a lesser human being I thought about it in the sense of showing our faith to people from different faith and how beautiful our religion is in the same context as a solution and rising above. What would your advice be given that I have a lot of friends from different faiths that I want to impact without being forceful? This is a beautiful uh, uh, point. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. So as we look at the Prophet example, notice 
that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for many people, he solved their problems of dunya before they were aware of the transformative power of Islam to solve their problems of the hereafter. No doubt, the most special part of Islam is la ilaha illallah, and the most important, and any problem of dunya does not compare with solving the problem of the akhirah. However, the door to the light of Islam, or at least to its acceptance, even if a person doesn't embrace it themselves, for many people is a door of dunya first. In other words, for many people, when they saw the Prophet ﷺ was so courageous in championing people's rights in the marketplace, or they saw in a society that looked down on women, how look at the household of the Prophet ﷺ, two of the four best women in history, are there at the same time, Khadija bint Khwailid and Fatima bint Muhammad. And the honor and dignity, look at what Islam did for people that were forgotten by society and became the likes of Bilal and Khabab radiallahu So it is prophetic for Islam not only to be a call of theology, but in fact, a source of goodness and relief for people. And this is also tied to our moment in American history. You know, two of the most hated and marginalized minorities in American history less than 100 years ago, but well, one that I'll mention here for time, was the Catholic minority. Even actually when John F. Kennedy was elected in 1960s, right? That there was still so much prejudice and so much hatred. Something that the Catholic minority did remarkably in this country that entirely changed their sentiment was that they imagined how to serve society through their faith. So notice that some of the best hospitals in the country are not only Catholic hospitals, but several faith-based hospitals that treat everybody. Actually, there's probably doctors in this community that have had residency or work in a hospital that is originally founded as a faith-based hospital, right? There you go, right here amongst us. Several of the best universities that are educating people were founded by faith-based communities. Some of the most impactful uh, uh, relief agencies feeding people, right? And this is not foreign to our deen. The Prophet said when he came to Medina, what did he tell people? Oh, people, spread peace feed one another, right, uh, until the end of the hadith. So they, they did this, and also uh, uh, refugee re resettlement, right, for all people, not just for their people. Now, of course, when we do these things, we're doing them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, but it brought the benefit also that it brought the faith closer to the awareness of people. That was the first, that they were served. And, and a core part of Islam is service. It's taking care of people. Serving people, the Prophet ﷺ, so many times, he doesn't say, okay, embrace Islam, then I'll go. No, he champions his right, and then people want to know, what, what's this remarkable face that moves people to this way? So that's a critical opportunity, inshallah, we have at this juncture. Jazakallah khair. Remember, service to each other or to the others is service to the Almighty Himself, without a doubt. So I think we'll start to draw to a close with that, we want to thank uh, Dr. Muhammad Tal. Let me ask you one personal question in, in ending, if I may. You, know, you so beautifully mentioned the, the, the dreams of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. And what about, you know, in this day and age, if we ha have a dream or something like that, does it mean something? Does it not? You know, we all have that kind of experience. What's your take on that as we end, inshallah? Yeah, so you know, I think as an American Muslim community, uh, we should dream to not only survive the hardships that we fight, but thrive as a community, right? It's remarkable that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the very darkest moments was the moments that he would extend the most hope to people. You think about how difficult uh, the moment of Ahzab was, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about the light of justice coming to Yemen and here and there, and people probably were just thinking, how can we make it through the night? 
So I think as an American Muslim community, especially you know, for youth and for the vulnerable, I think we're looking for people that extend that hope, right? For ourselves and for society in general in this very dark time. And a big part of that is really the, the vehicle through which this change happens today's institutions. So as I was saying, I feel really at home at Wayland, alhamdulillah, you know, connecting through this education with the Boston Islamic Seminary. We really want to imagine the next generation and our families thriving as Muslims. And part of that, you know, it's really overwhelming as a father and a mother or as a family. There's a lot to take on. But when a space like this, our families feel at home, not just at our homes back there, when you feel like this is our extended family, when you feel like we're all trying to lift one another up and to spread that, to me, that's a dream that we can have as a community, inshallah. And we can support one another through education, through advocacy, through conversations. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to renew this gathering, inshallah, to continue to bless the people of this community. If you allow, inshallah, we'll close with a dua. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of all of the vulnerable, oppressed all across the world, and most especially in Palestine, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish justice for them, to protect them from the hands of oppression and wrongdoing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use us for every cause of justice. We ask Allah to make the light of faith and iman and Islam firm in our hearts, the hearts of our children, our families, our communities. Ameen. We ask Allah to make, to guide us, to guide through us, to make us to a cause of guidance for others. Amen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth as the truth and to bless us as to follow it. Amen. To show us falsehood as falsehood and bless us to avoid it. Amen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us steadfastness, regular darity in his worship Amen. in expressing gratitude to him and remembering him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to bless us in these months of what remains of Rajab and Sha'ban and to allow us to witness Ramadan Ameen. in health and accepted worship. We ask Allah to bless this community and bless the surrounding communities. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he gathered us in this gathering to renew this gathering in a higher companionship with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ نَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَوْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ 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 رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ صَلَّى الل